good morning. We're here with Robert W. Poorman, uh, an Army veteran. This is the uh, Veterans History Project. This is his experiences with and in the military. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. My name is Jim McRaven. I'm a retired Navy veteran, and also I was a disabled veteran outreach program specialist. Something I hadn't mentioned to you is my father was Navy. That's very interesting. I We were dis discussing that I was a third-generation Navy guy. I was also in the Army, too. Oh, okay. So, uh, we know that you were in the Army. Robert, uh, before going in the Army, is there anything you'd like to talk about your life and why you decided to go into the Army? Well, I had known I was going to go into the Army since I was maybe six or seven years old. Um, I believe it was uh, every Tuesday or Wednesday evening, my father and I would sit on the couch, and uh, it was the only time I was allowed to eat dinner in the front room, uh, and we'd watch combat and Sergeant Saunders. And uh, we'd watch it, and uh, I always knew I was going to, you know, go in. And of course, I grew up uh, during the Vietnam War, and uh, I watched the body counts and all that sort of stuff, and the war kept going on, and I always thought, well, I'm going to go to Vietnam. Of course, it ended in 75, uh, and I was uh, still only a junior in, or a sophomore in high school, uh, junior, I believe. And uh, I was walking down the stairs of school when they, everybody was cheering and yelling and said, you know, the war's over officially and all this. But I didn't derail me. I still wanted to go into the military. So. Okay, what we would like to discuss is your schooling, your specialty training, and any of the instructors that... Uh, struck you as different, unusual, or outstanding? Okay. Well, uh, I grew up in Bridgeport and uh, attended... Uh, I come from a large Irish Catholic family. Uh, there were seven of us. And uh, my mom used to... Uh, she was only a waitress, and she was divorced at the time. And uh, so she, one year she would send us to St. Mary's uh, Immaculate Conception, and the next year we'd go to public school and she'd save up for the year to send us back to Catholic school. So I spent a lot of time, uh, if I was sent to the public school, I spent like three months waiting for everybody to catch up to me. When I went to the Catholic school, it took me, I had to work hard for three months to catch up to everybody else. Uh, after that, I went to Kelly High School on the uh, south side on uh, 41st in California. And I really loved it. High school was a great time for me. I know a lot of people say that they don't, uh, didn't enjoy their high school life or anything like that. I love mine. Uh, I was very active in sports, uh, key club. Uh, I helped start the uh, photography class there with the help of a, a counselor, Mr. Dubeck. And uh, we got went around and got donations and got all the equipment for starting up our dark room. I was uh, a photographer for the yearbook club and uh, I participated in swimming, wrestling, and football and littered in all of those. Okay, now let's get back to your military training. Oh, one more Basically. thing. I, did, I would like to give a special mention sure. that uh, Mr. Dubeck uh, was also my counselor and he gave me a lot of good advice and everything. But the one person that, or the two people that I have to say, well, actually three people that really influenced my life and actually helped me out uh, preparing my attitude for when I would go into the military. Uh, there were my three coaches, uh, Mr. Tribeck, Mr. Foss, and Coach Pentagrass. Uh, coach, Ken coach Pentagrass was my football coach, uh, uh, Mr. Foss was my wrestling coach, and Mr. Tribeck was my swim coach. And um, they taught me 
you have to have the right attitude, you have to have uh, the will to win, you have to be a team player, and I believe that that served me very, very well when I went to basic training. It does sound like that uh, you went to basic training and then we'll talk, we'll talk about that a little bit, an instructor that really got to you, and then uh, I thought I saw 11 Bravo on your uh, thing, so you must have went to uh, advanced infantry training or something. Yes, I did. So let's cover that area. Well, I went to Sand Hill and uh, in down in Georgia, Fort Benning, home of the infantry. I was the part of the second unit to go through OST, uh, one station training. My first company was uh, Alpha Company. Uh, that was for basic training. And then we switched our barracks to next door, and next door switched over to ours, and uh, that's where we took our advanced infantry training. Are there any instructors that stick out in your mind? I, I am so bad at names. Um, well, I can, can close my eyes, I can, can see, see their that. faces, but I, I don't remember all their names. And Is there an incident that you find that you really remember? In basic training? Mm -hmm. Oh, dozens, really dozens. Um, what was your favorite? My favorite. I really don't have a, a favorite. It's just a, in basic training uh, and uh, advanced training, the whole process, I actually enjoyed my time. But I do remember prior to getting on the bus, we were at uh, Fort Jackson where we were issued all of our equipment. And the chaplain had us all in the auditorium. And he said one thing to us, and uh, he said, I thank God every day that I went through basic training. And then I thank God every day I don't have to do it again. <laughs> so I really enjoyed my time. Um, my hardest time in basic training was becoming a runner. I, even though I had done sports, I mean, like my biggest running experience was maybe doing a few laps around the football field. I was not a jogger. I was not a runner. When I went in, I was weighing 235. I had, when I signed up, I was 250. I still had a build of a football player and a heavyweight wrestler. And uh, they wouldn't let me join until I got down to uh, 235. And when I left basic training, I was 190. And your AIT, how did that go? AIT, uh, basically, it, I mean, it, it was one station training. It was, uh, there, there was like, there was no break. It was, I mean, there was, it was just a continuation of steps, advanced learning. Uh, the, uh, I had a good time in uh, uh, at all. Uh, I found out that I was actually a, a very good natural shooter. Uh, I've always scored expert. Um, and then uh, hand grenades, uh, very easy. I played a lot of baseball growing up. Uh, it was a little bit heavier than a baseball, but... And uh, unfortunately, um, they teach you how to throw the hand grenade, just like this. No, <laughs> we throw it like a ball. <laughs> um, and like I said, I just had a great time. I, one of the things I used to love to do was go on the obstacle courses. Uh, climb the ladder, it's about 30 feet off the ground. And then I'd sit at the top there and help other guys get over. Because some guys could get up to the top, but they couldn't cross over to go the way down. Um, uh, about the only thing that gave me a hard time was the tower. The tower was kind of hard to uh, for me to climb. I, I could get up there, but it was it was a struggle. I was never good at pull ups until I got to the hundred first. And at the hundred first, every single day, you had to do at least ten good pull ups. The hundred and first airborne. Right. Uh, the biggest thing we had in uh, basic training in AIT was the 
um, I guess monkey bars. It's the horizontal ladder where the rollers spin, so you have to develop a good grip. And uh, we'd have to do it in the morning, and then we'd have to do it at breakfast. At lunch, it was built right outside the chow hall, and during the evening meal. And you couldn't eat until you got cooked across the bars. And I just I developed thick, thick calluses. Uh, we're both military, so sometimes we say funny things. But I'm just curious, being in the 101st Airborne Division, did you jump out of any good, perfectly good airplanes? Perfectly good helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly good helicopters, both the Huey and the... Uh, Explain the, what I just said so those that are viewing this in the future would understand what we meant. Well, well, the joke is, is that why in the world would anybody leave a perfectly good aircraft? And uh, now, the 101st Airborne, when I was there, was not an airborne unit. We were air assault. Uh, when I jumped out, I was attached to a 120-foot rope and we would repel out of the helicopters. I went through the uh, air assault school there and uh, got my wings. And uh, the 101st had this great thing was on your days off and your time off, like if you wanted to skip lunch, you can go down to the air assault school and bring your gear, get in line, and you can jump out of a helicopter and I would do that all the time. I, the, the school was only two blocks away from us. I was in the uh, Charlie Company, 2nd and 503rd. And where was that uh, station at? At, the at, at Campbell. Now it's station. It, it was at Campbell at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, now it's uh, part of the, uh, the 173rd in uh, Italy. So where were you stationed in and out of country? Well... I'm very unique. Uh, I spent eight years in the military. I only spent two years here in the States. Well, 13 months each time. Uh, my first duty station when I got out of basic training, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I'd signed up, well, I actually signed up for two things uh, when I joined. I did not take a bonus. Uh, and my uh, recruiting sergeant told me, well, if you take a bonus, uh, you have to commit for four years, and you'll only be in the infantry. Now, he knew that I wanted to be an MP at the time. And he says, if you don't take the bonus, as an infantryman, you can go any place that the Army needs you. If they have an opening in the MP uh, battalion, you could be transferred over there. All you got to do is put the paperwork in. And he wasn't really lying because out of my eight years, I spent four years in military intelligence. Uh, I was an instructor for, well, first I was a, uh, I was uh, brought in as a driver for the uh, colonel for G2 and 2nd Infantry Division. And when I wasn't driving, I was expected to be an intel analyst, and I had to go through the correspondence courses, and I got on-the-job training, and I got pretty good at it. And then after my first year, I, was, I extended my tour, and they put me in the Op 4 team, where I became an instructor and taught uh, units all up and down Korea about how to use... Uh, the uh, weapons and tactics of the basically Soviet Union doctrine, but specializing mostly in what North Korea had. Um, so, what I was, what I'm trying to get to is, if as an 11B, I could go at just about any place. So I didn't take a bonus, and uh, but I did sign up to uh, go airborne and Korea. The day before we graduated, my drill sergeants called me into their little room and said, Porman, we've got a problem. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, you can either go airborne or you can go to Korea. And I said, wait a minute, I got a contract. Well, first they talked to me for about 15 minutes. And I said, no, no, we got a contract, we got a contract. And they said, 
the Army is not going to send you to airborne school and didn't send you to Korea. And he says, you know, you can either go to airborne school or you can go to Korea. Maybe you'll get orders later for airborne school. You can put it on your wish list. And every year I put it on my wish list, or every time I was due to be reassigned. Never got to the 82nd. Got to the 101st, still didn't get to jump out of planes. Uh, but they said, you can have one or the other. And I said, hold on, it's written in my contract. I want both. They says, well, pack your bags, we're sending you home. <laughs> so I chose to go to Korea because I really did want to go overseas. I wanted to see the world. And little did I know that I fell in love with the place and ended up spending six years there. Uh, it was a hardship tour, usually just 12 months. But uh, I loved the place, so I extended then I went to the United States, went to the 101st. As soon as I, first week I was back at, in, in country at the 101st, I went to admin and put my paperwork in to go back to Korea. 13 months later, because it again, it is a hardship, um, hardship duty station. They uh, love to suck people in to go back, you know, go over there. So uh, I, 13 months later, I'm back in Korea, and I spent another two years there, and then I went to Fort Carson in Colorado uh, with the 4th Infantry Division. And with that unit, I was with the 1st of the 12th, Bravo Company, and uh, mechanized. Now, I'm a straight leg. You know, for people who don't know the difference is, is a straight leg is we walk every place. Now you got guys who go airborne. Well, airborne means you're, they're gonna fly you there, but you're walking back. <laughs> At least with the air assault, uh, they'll fly you in and sometimes they'll pick you up. <laughs> but I'm a straight leg. But then when I got to the, uh, Fort Carson, it was mechanized, and so I had to learn to do everything differently. Um, my squad was a little bit smaller, because you can't fit that many guys into a M113 APC, Armored Personnel Carrier. And uh, funny story, uh, when I got there, I was made a squad leader. I was a squad leader also when I got to uh, 101st. I also became the unit armorer. And then about halfway through my tour with the 101st, I became the CO's radio operator. And the reason why I had that was is that when I first got to Korea, my first duty station was with the Joint Security Area at Panmunjom. Um, I got that uh, because I met three of the criterias to be in that unit. I had a GT score of over 100. If you're familiar with the GT scores, it's an intelligence uh, that it just rates your intelligence. I had a one twenty. I, I had a one twenty seven, so that put me well, well ahead of there. I was over six feet tall because at Panmunjom you're facing the North Koreans every day. Uh, no, they've got some pretty big ones, and they're all fifth degree black belts. So they didn't expect the U.S. soldiers to be black belts, um, but they wanted bruisers, guys that could take care of themselves. And uh, the third thing is, is since I came straight out of the basic trainings, I had no Article 15s. <laughs> so I spent my first uh, first uh, duty tour in, in, in at Panmunjom, and uh, how I got. Dad, I remember I was at the Yangsan Replacement Center, Repo Depot, and uh, they called me into the office and they said, I was supposed to go to the 2nd Infantry Division. They, they said, well, we have an opportunity, but you got to volunteer. It's very dangerous. And they said, we want to send you to Panmunjom. At the time I had landed in Korea, I really didn't know anything about Korea. I didn't know anything about the war. I mean, I knew there was one, uh, but I didn't know about how live the action was in the DMZ. I didn't know there was a DMZ. I was very ill-prepared. 
And the guy turned around, pointed at a map, and said, you'll be over there. And I looked at the map, and I said, that's in North Korea. And he says, no, but you're only about 100 yards away. <laughs> And actually, North Korea runs right down the middle of JSA on the main street. And uh, that was a great time. But while I was there, I had to get a secret clearance. And my secret clearance was a key for a lot of things while I was in the military. And it's why I became very com conversed in using radios, because I was always made to do radio watch and carry a radio. Um, which is not the best thing in the world because if anybody knows anything about the infantry, the radio man in the field, in combat, lasts about 13 seconds. You take out the radio, you take out half the firepower. So, um, you know, I'm starting to lose track. Okay. Um, we were, um, I was talking. a lot of people do not realize that you were on the crossing point between North and South Korea. Yes. Okay. While you were there, were there any incidents that happened that definitely stick out in your mind? Actually, I had a fairly um, uh, uneventful tour. I mean, uh, I was there in 78, 79. Um, we didn't have any major incidents at Panmunjom itself. Uh, in '84, they had the uh, the gunfire, and uh, there was a few KIA's and uh, uh, wounded in actions there. When a Soviet cook uh, crossed the line and defected to, well, South Korean America. I mean, like, actually, I think he ended up here in America. Uh, he ran across the line, gave us no warning. Uh, the North Koreans came out with AK-47s. Our guys only had 45s initially. They had to bring the M-16s in. And uh, so that's why we were always issued, well, we were issued two clips, but every man in the unit had an extra two in their pocket. And uh, so you're always prepared there. I mean, like they're, the place is famous for brawls, fisticuffs. It was um, after 1976, though, where they built a little strip. It was, um, let me see if I remember it correctly, it was 12 inches wide, 2 inches tall, and it goes straight down the middle of Panmunjom. And this was the demarcation line between North and South Korea. You could step right over it and be in North Korea. Uh, so there wasn't any physical fence or anything like that, but the North Koreans from that, after the Axe murder in 1976, were supposed to stay on their side. We stayed on our side. The only place where you can cross over, and I have been in North Korea many times, was inside the conference room. The conference room itself is divided right down the middle. There's a table like this, there's a white piece of tape, and this would be North Korea, this is South Korea. South Koreans have a, uh, South Koreans have a flag, the North Koreans have a flag. And there's, uh, JSA was a uh, series of one-off twin ships. Um, when they first started meeting in that building, um, one of the uh, generals brought a little U.S. flag and put it there in the corner. Next day, the North Koreans came in, but they had a little bit bigger one. Next day, they came in, and they had put the flag on a taller pedestal. <laughs> Next day, the North Koreans came in with one, had an even taller pedestal. And then the next day, they had a bigger flag. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, and that's just, that's just the... Uh, it's, it's just, the whole thing's always been about one of the ships. Uh, they built the Freedom House. And at the time that they built the Freedom House, which is in JS, uh, which is in the South Korean portion, the North Korean portion only had a little pagoda. 
within 72 hours, they built this facade. A huge two-story, almost three-story building. Okay? The reason why I say three-story is they built it on a mount. And then they have these big, broad steps. But it's all an optical illusion. When our tourists would come to JSA, they would see this building. And it looks massive. But it's only like 14 feet wide. Okay? The doors... The North Korean carts would stand by the doors, and they look like huge monsters because our doors are about almost seven feet tall, or six foot eight, or something like that. Um, their doors were like only, you know, maybe six feet, so they looked much bigger. The steps were an optical illusion, uh, made it look all grander. But I think that what they were is they were a little bit lower but longer. The treads. <coughs> So, I mean, the whole, the whole series, I mean, we put in a, uh, a, uh, a watchtower. Well, they had to put in a bigger watchtower. So, um, so lots of funs and games in, in the JSA. So, you, where else did you serve besides Korea and the, you know, overseas? Well, after, uh, like I said, I extended my tour. So I finally got my chance to go to 2nd Infantry Division. And I was with the uh, A Company, 1st of the 38th, at Camp Hovey. Huge difference from JSA. At JSA, JSA is considered an elite unit. We had beautiful barracks, great food, our own club. We had a swimming pool. We had a golf course. It's the most dangerous golf course in the world. It's only one hole, okay? And on the sign, and I, I brought a picture of it, on the sign it says, as stated in Sports Illustrated, the world's most dangerous uh, golf course. Do not recover balls from the rough. It's a landmine, or it's a minefield. <laughs> so, uh, beautiful base. It, it was called Camp Kitty Hawk at the time when I was there. A couple of years later, after uh, it was renamed for uh, Captain Bonifist, who was the uh, CO for JSA or the JSF, the Joint Security Force, um, who was one of the two officers who were killed during the 1976 axe murders. And that was all about pruning a tree. And we have, up on the hill, we have uh, obs Observation Post 5, and we look at uh, Checkpoint 3, which is at the Bridge of No Return. Originally, why they call it the Bridge of No Return is during the repatriation of, of prisoners after the Korean War was settled. Uh, we would warn all the North Koreans and Chinese, if you cross over this bridge, you can't come back. So make up your mind. Do you want to go back? Most of them did, but a few hundred stayed. And uh, but we couldn't because of this popular tree that was growing. We couldn't see. It was just getting bigger and bigger. We couldn't see the the the, the guard shack. So they sent some guys in to prune. The first day they chased the gardeners off. Next day we showed up in force, but. We didn't bring any guns, we just brought axe handles. And we weren't even carrying the axe handles. All of a sudden, one of the North Korean guardsmen remember at this time, North Koreans could be on our side, we could be on their side. Um, they had a superior number of North Korean um, KPA, Korean People Army personnel there. And uh, they started causing a ruckus about uh, them pruning the tree. And the CO walked up to one of the officers and said, it's, we have to cut it down, you know, prune it. And they said, no, trees are sacred in Korea. And then he took off his wristwatch and then slapped the crap out of the 
CO, and then the fight starts. They had guys running towards this deuce and a half truck that we had, and that's where they had the axe handles, and unfortunately, because they, we didn't station anybody in the truck to pass out the axe handles, they had to climb up in the truck, and the North Koreans were pulling them off, and it took a while for anybody to get armed. Well, these guys were, you know, kung fu flying, taekwondo flying all over the place. Uh, a couple of them had grabbed some of the work implements that the South Korean workers that were using to prune the trees, and that's why it became known as the axe murderer. They had, uh, um, one enlisted man uh, actually caught an axe, but part of it had split his hand open. Um, I actually know him uh, through uh, Facebook. Uh, it starts with an L. I can't remember his name right now. Um, and but they killed our, the two officers, the captain and the lieutenant, platoon, uh, platoon leader. Um, so uh, again, I kind of lost my thought about where I was originally, what we were originally. Talking we about. were talking about. Uh, oh, what, what duty stations I had there. Right. Okay, so uh, like I said, I was with A Company, first of the thirty eighth. Um, in October, I'm back into DMC. Uh, because every infantry unit there uh, spent uh, several months. Our, ours was always uh, October through December, almost up till Christmas. Uh, and then the first and the ninth would take over for us. And I think we took over for the first of the 31st, the polar bears. And the first and the ninth were the Manchus. We were the uh, Rock of the Marne, first of the 38th. And uh, we actually had a very uh, scary time up there. While we were there, um, President for Life, uh, or pretty much President for Life, uh, because he did have his elections, but he was never going to get beaten. Uh, Park Chung-hee, who was previously General Park Chung-hee before the coup, and he had been President for well over 10 years there maybe a little bit longer, I can't remember the exact dates. He was assassinated by the um, director of the KCIA. Uh, but nobody knew at the time. So the horns go off, we're in the, at Warrior Base and at the guard posts in the DMZ. Uh, we get the alert, we crawl out of our bunkers, we're manning the uh, our uh, trenches, we're making sure the claymores are ready. Our artillery site uh, just outside of uh, the DMC, Fort Papa 1, are prepping the 105s. And we're expecting to see columns of tanks rolling through Kaesong and right up the road because we are, we straddled the MSR. And we MSR figured that they're. What? Uh, the main supply, main supply, supply route. There's like MSR one, MSR two, MSR three, uh, depending on direct lines. It from you have to understand is that from Panmunjom to Seoul, it's uh, only forty miles away. Um, so actually, Seoul is under the gun for some of their more long range. Uh, Artillery, I think the 122s could reach there, and also frog missiles and scud missiles. And to this day, they're still under, and uh, which has always been a great vulnerability for the uh, for our people, uh, or for the South Koreans. Uh, when they made Seoul the capital, uh, we tried to tell them that they needed to. Um, don't do it. Um, move your capital down to uh, Tegu, uh, Wonsan, any place but not Seoul because you're just too close to the DMC. The South Koreans are very proud. And they said, no, it's going to be here. So currently I think there's 12 million people in Seoul and they've grown up and lived under the gun. Just like most of the U.S. bases in the second within the Second Infantry Division, uh, at the time I was there, 
Just recently, they've opened up Camp Humphreys and are moving the entire, almost the entire division um, down south, and it's out of uh, Pyong. I don't want to say Pyongyang because that's the capital of North Korea. Uh, Pyongju or some Pyongju, I think it is. Um, I had spent some time at Camp Humphreys during the uh, my time with first the thirty eighth. Uh, we used to have some uh, interested in uh, missiles there, and we used, every unit had spent thirty days there to guard them. Uh, but Camp Humphreys at the time when I was there was also where they trained our Katusas. Now, Katusa stands for Koreans Augmented to the United States Army. All of, uh, all of the units in Korea are, um, have a certain number of Korean personnel in each squad. Each platoon, each company, every battalion headquarters, um, they're all college uh, educated, they are... Um, they all have a certain amount of uh, martial arts training. They all are proficient in English. They have to take tests and everything like this. The reason for it is if the balloon goes up, we need interpreters. And we need them right there, right now. And along the way, also in peacetime, they would tell us, you know, hey, uh, these are the kind of customs that we have. These are the things you're supposed to do, you know. Um, like one custom is is uh, something we would take for granted here in the United States is you might be sitting outside and tip a bottle of Coke up or drink out of a bottle and uh, carry a, you know a, a drink around uh, you know collapsible or something like that. You're not supposed to drink on the. I mean, it, you, this just a custom. You know, you just don't drink outside. You know. I mean, they allow us to use our canteens and stuff like that, but you know, you can't you can't walk around with a bottle of Coke and be sipping it on the street. So I was with the first of the thirty eighth, um, and I was uh, an infantryman there. While I was there, I became a dragon gunner. I was also an M sixty gunner. I later became the CO's driver and radio operator. And uh, then um, our, we got a call from the battalion. This is after uh, I went to the DMC. And one of the, one of the greatest things that I have about uh, when I went to the DMC is I became an MGM scout. Um, the MGM scout badge is considered the poor man's uh, combat infantry badge. But like I said, we were really scared during the time of... Uh, Park Chung He's assassination because we just expected that, you know, and the columns of tanks to become an infantry, artillery to be flying pretty soon, and uh, we weren't even a bump in the road. We weren't, you know, we and we had no way of running to Freedom Bridge to get back across the uh, um, Jim River. Oh, wait, wait, no, it's not the Jim River. Yeah, um, yeah, the Indrift River. So, um, after I was uh, with the 1st of 38, the uh, battalion commander put out a call, said his his driver is going home. Uh, he's dearesting back to the United States, and uh, all the companies had to send their CO drivers up to be interviewed. I was selected to become the driver for the battalion headquarters. I lasted one day there because the uh, brigade commander's driver left that was leaving the next week. So all the battalions had to send their drivers. And again, I was selected. So I spent like three months of my last tour driving the uh, battalion uh, colonel around, or uh, brigade commander around. We want to finish up with Korea and find out if you were anywhere else because we want to find out where you were when you got out of the service. Well, after uh, after my time with uh, JSA, the 1st of the 38th, and 2nd Brigade HHC, uh, 
I got my orders to go to the 101st. And uh, I went to Charlie Company, Hard Rock Charlie, uh, first of the 38th. Uh, I remember uh, my uh, battalion commander, Smoking Joe Kinzer, and uh, Sergeant Major Leroy Brown. Legendary figures, both of them. Really, they are. Uh, I met a lot of good officers, a lot of good NCOs while I was in the service. And as I said, uh, I only spent 13 months there. I did go through air assault training. I went through unit armor training. And I also went uh, through uh, uh, training to become the unit's drug and alcohol counselor. We had a term, I, I mentioned I w was in the Army, and I don't mean to speak, but we had a term that uh, if you went to drug and alcohol training, they had a derogatory term for it saying you were going to watermelon you. Okay. Good. You remember that term, don't you? It's derogatory. But you were looked down upon. Uh -huh. because you were the lowest thing that ever existed. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, what uh, lessons did you bring back from the military? Well, let me, let me finish up with my next okay. unit, okay? This is what I was really proud of. Is, uh, like I said, I was in G2. I did two tours with them. I... Uh, um, as I said, uh, I was selected from the Turtle Farm at Camp Casey. The Turtle Farm is uh, the repo depot, the uh, replacement center. And uh, the reason why it's called the Turtle Farm is that the in-processing building is here, and next door is the out-processing building. It's 13 steps away, but it takes you a whole year to walk across it. And uh, so I got picked up from the turtle farm. They needed uh, a driver for G2. I had the license, I had the security. Um, they went through my records and uh, they came by, picked me up in a Jeep and uh, off I went. And I got interviewed and uh, was uh, hired on the, uh, the that day. And uh, the I got three days with the old driver and uh, showed me what my duties were going to be and then I got to drive them to Kimpo Airport and that was my first time driving through Seoul and I've got a safety award in here which I'm kind of proud of because uh, well, so only after my first six months but uh, Seoul is one of the most dangerous traffic areas in the world. Um, I swear there was only times where there was a millimeter between me and another car. And I'm just driving a slow bum Jeep. <laughs> uh, so I became a driver there. And as I said before, uh, when I wasn't driving, I was expected to do work around the office. And one of the first things that uh, Sergeant Major Dose did, um, and he's somebody I really remember and respect a lot. He's the actual person who uh, took me under his wing and uh, turned me from somebody who was in for a tour and uh, talked me into staying in. And I didn't stay in, but I did re-up and everything. And uh, Sergeant Major Didos was uh, a... Korean War vet, Special Forces, um, Vietnam, um, and his last duty station, I believe, was as the Sergeant Major of the 82nd Airborne. And uh, he only held the position for six months before he left. It was more or less an honorary uh, slot just to put on his record. But uh, He's well-loved in the military, and uh, he's the one who told me I need to start taking correspondence courses, and I did that and passed them all. But I didn't get awarded the uh, MOS 
because for military intelligence, you can take the correspondence course, but you have to go to uh, the fort in Arizona. I can't know. Fort Huachuca, I yes. think it is. And I had to go there and never did. So um, just have all the training and job experience, just never got the uh, sheepskin. So uh, as I said before, I spent uh, my first year as a driver and military analyst, uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the field I, because I was an infantryman. Also, I went out with the uh, Division TAC, the Tactical Operations Center. Um, I did everything from driving to radio operations, of course, setting up camo, uh, doing whatever needed to be done. We were the forward element for the division, and we operated out of two APCs. Um, one APC had uh, the G2 and the G3, and the other APC had the uh, FSO and the uh, Air Force equivalent for the FSO. Uh, Fire support officer. Right, but the Air Force has a different name for it. And uh, then I, after uh, my first year, they I had extended again, and uh, they sent me to the Op 4 team. Op 4 stands for Opposing Forces. And this is where I really had some of the best times in the military and in Korea. As an instructor, I got to go visit over 30 bases in Korea. Um, Everything from 8th Army to Navy. Uh, I got to train Marines from Okinawa, Navy personnel down in Busan. Uh, I, just, I went every place, up and down the Korean Peninsula. I had 126 AK-47s that were functional. I had RPG-2s, RPG-7s. Uh, I had uh, DP Pan machine guns, RP. Uh, um, uh, uh, PK machine guns. Uh, there's a variant of the AK-47 which is uh, has a longer barrel and bipod attached to it. And I'm trying to remember what its nomenclature is. It takes it's all, it's just an AK-47 with a bigger and longer barrel, heavier barrel, but it's good to about 800 meters. It's an excellent weapon. And actually, let me just tell you something. Um, I, I mentioned before, I've always been very good with weapons. Oh, one of the schools I went through when I was at Fort Carson is I went through the Master Marksmanship Program. Um, it was actually taught by a Brit, and uh, the reason why he had, uh, uh, we were instituting the max, Master Marksmanship Training was it seems that the United States Army had forgotten how to shoot as well as we used to in the past because we used to have a lot of country boys who knew a lot about windage, curvature of the earth, how the bullets drop, and everything like this. And so we went. I went through a month-long course, and then uh, for my graduation, I had to take two people from my unit and put them in competition. Um, and uh, one of the persons that I did, I selected, did very, very well. Anyway, I graduated from that. But I was very good at um, shooting, so I had uh, zeroed in an AK-47, and uh, I started practicing with it. I had a lot of uh, live rounds. I got about 200,000 live rounds each year supplied to me. We would go around to different units, and take them out to the firing ranges. I became qualified as a range NCO, and uh, we would uh, just shoot them up. And uh, when I, you ever heard of during the Granada where the one soldier got uh, struck in his Kevlar helmet with a bullet and stopped the bullet? Well, what a lot of people don't know is the reason why it stopped the bullet is it came in through the front so it was penetrating the side of the wall and got stuck like this. I found out if you shoot a Kevlar helmet this way, uh, because we had a lot of cracked um, Kevlar unit or Kevlar helmets in our um, supply unit, so I was able to take those out to the range. I'd shoot at them and 
bang, 7.62 by 39 millimeter round went right through them. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, but I also uh, zeroed in an AK-47 for myself. And uh, I went and would shoot against people in other units who had the M16. And I'd usually beat them out. You always heard that the AK-47 is only good to about 300 meters, and the M16 is good out to 450. No, I could hit accurately at 600. Just like an, a uh, an M16, you could hit out to 600, as long as you just watch how you, you know, drop the round in on the target. And uh, so we all have our propaganda. So the AK-47 is very rugged and very dependable rifle. One of the things I would do on the range is I would pick up a handful of dirt, pop open the top receiver of the AK-47, drop the dirt in there, put the thing on there, charge the handle, step up to the fire range and start firing. And people would look at me like, I got a little bit of carbon and my M16 won't shoot. <laughs> so I uh, did a year of um, of uh, Op 4 and uh, then I went to Fort Carson and while I was at Fort Carson um, I finally got my sergeant stripes uh, and I was a squad leader and I went to Fort Irwin I was on the Op 4 team there and uh, became a desert raider uh, and then I got my orders to go back to Korea. So while I was in Korea, I was at the repo depot, and um, they would let let NCOs out and roam about. So I went back to my old unit just to see how things were going. Totally brand new guys there, and they didn't have a clue about anything. It seemed that the NCO who took over from me had left country dropped the ball on training, um, didn't, he was, and when they selected somebody else, he was just so busy about clearing, processing, he didn't show anybody anything, so I'm standing there and I'm digging through my old desk and I'm pulling out lesson plans and I'm standing there talking and I'm talking to these guys and then uh, the uh, OIC for the unit walks into, you know, into the Quonset Hut, our office, and uh, he says, who's this? And I introduced myself, said I used to be an instructor here, and the guy said, we need him, we need him. That afternoon, I got orders, and I'm back on the Op 4 team. And I spent the next two years doing that. Um, after uh, my first year, they finally sent me to... Uh, um, Maryland um, to the uh, uh, no not Annapolis uh, it's, it's there's a base in there in Fort no 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 it starts with an A I believe uh, oh god like I said I'm bad at names um, I've got a certificate for it but I went through the uh, foreign weapons program um, this is after teaching it for two years, <laughs> so it was just merely getting the sheepskin. Uh, the only reason why I got to go there is that, uh, you know how in the military, uh, if you have excess funds and you don't spend them, you lose them. So uh, my colonel, uh, the G2 and the XO decided to spend some money to send me to across uh, the Pacific, across country, to uh, Maryland, and I got to go through the training. It was about a week long, and then uh, I flew back to Korea. Uh, but I got my sheepskin for that. Uh, and then I spent 86 again in, the, uh, in there, and uh, like I said, I had a great time I loved being an instructor. Uh, I, I uh, also was given the uh, hotel designation 
which is the instructor designation. Uh, some people look at my records and see uh, um, that I was a hotel, and they thought I was a drill, drill instructor. And I said, no, no, I was an op for instructor. Uh, but uh, I got to see a lot of Korea, meet a lot of people, and uh, a lot of troops, a lot of Koreans, and guys from different uh, units from uh, all over the world. Great time. So you, <clears throat> Korea was a place that you apparently enjoyed, and that was ma mainly your military career. And I'm sure, well, no, I don't know. There's, it, did anything you learn in the military lead to a civilian career afterwards? Well, not really per se, okay? Um, but there was a lot of tools that I picked up in the military that helped me in my... Um, I mean, I learned, well, I, like I said, I'd always been a team player, uh, but uh, I learned how to uh, lead, to delegate, uh, to instruct, uh, gave me uh, more patience because, well, things are going to happen. What are you doing now? What's your job now? So right now I'm uh, looking for work. Um, but uh, I have over 30 years in customer service. When I got out, uh, I my first uh, position was as a... Uh, well, I, I temporarily worked at a Ford plant in Tennessee, Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, they started me off at just under $6 an hour. And... Uh, I thought, okay, well, after my initial time here, then I should be getting the big bucks. And I asked somebody about a week or two later and asked, they had been there for several years, said, how much are you making? She made $7, and I said, I need a new job. <laughs> and I ended up becoming a correction officer in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I worked the, war, the, uh, the units there, um, and I did a good enough job that they selected me to work in maximum security and death row. And I also joined their TAC team, which is uh, basically the SWAT team. Um, and I spent uh, almost three years there. And uh, missed my family, decided to come back to Chicago. When I got back here, I became uh, one of the... I, position one of the most hated uh, people in Chicago. Um, I worked for Lincoln Towing and rendered services and I used to steal people's cars out of parking lots where they weren't supposed to be parking. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then I uh, got a job in roofing and later became a carpenter, joined a union, Worked at McCormick Place, worked for a number of companies, and uh, but here in Chicago, when you're a carpenter and a roofer, you don't uh, get much work in the winter. So, what employers would do is they want to keep their crews; they would send them down south and look for work down there. The only problem with that is. Everybody in the South knows how to use a hammer. And uh, so we weren't getting as much work as we needed to. And uh, But a position opened up in the wintertime, and my boss said, well, I can let you work in our telemarketing department. So I went to work there. I found out I was good on the telephones. I was making decent money in commissions. And then later, um, after a couple of years of that, uh, I got a better position working for Superior Bank, basically as a uh, mortgage officer, but uh, basically doing everything over the telephone, collect collecting data, getting paperwork, 
Um, I didn't approve loans, but um, I was also the person who had to tell people, well, you didn't qualify. Well, I was pre-qualified. Well, I'm sorry, you weren't qualified. So I had to break the news to them gently and, you know, throw them a, a line and tell them, you know, well, if you can pull up your credit score in six months, we can open this back up. Can't guarantee the same rate and all that. And then I got uh, another position working in benefits. Uh, and then I joined uh, APAC, uh, which uh, we did mostly everything over the Internet. This is back during the, uh, uh, the big bubble in the late 90s. And uh, worked there until the crash. And, but I stayed in customer service uh, all the way up until uh, 2007. And then my brother-in-law asked me to manage his business. And he was uh, doing... Uh, repairs for apartment buildings. Um, he had a number of contracts and I would order supplies, keep track of the paperwork, drum up business, deal with customers. And since I'd already been in the trade, I knew what I was talking about. And uh, I can give estimate on hours because I knew how long a job would take. And then after that, uh, my mother got ill. Um, she was in her 80s, and uh, I moved in with her, me and my two sons. She passed away two years ago, so I got a job working at State Liquors over there on Pershing, and I worked there for until recently. Now I'm out looking about. But I've, uh, in a lot of jobs, I became a manager, an assistant manager, and I can only owe that to my skills that I developed in the military. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the interview, Robert. Uh, it's fascinating, I have to say. Uh, no. Do you have anything that you want people to know <clears throat> this is your legacy. Well, I'm of the personal opinion that every young man and every young woman should serve their nation, whether in the military or in some sort of civilian volunteer or paid program, and do their stint three years I mean, if you work for um, any of the many organizations out there, uh, civilian side, you'll learn a lot of the basic skills of being working with teams, being a member, leading teams. Uh, but the important thing is that you get away from where you grew up. One statistic that I know, uh, this is back during my days in collections, was 80% of the United States population has never traveled more than 50 miles away from their home. Uh, you need to see the world. You need to meet people around the world. You need to see people in other states of this beautiful country of ours. Um, the, we're very diverse, and, but we're also united. And people are people all over the world. Uh, and I, I think it's just important that young people get experience with this. It's going to benefit you for the rest of your life. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Oh.